Welcome to Dream Loudly, an iPossible original show sponsored by the Dream Loudly Foundation. The Dream Loudly Foundation, of course, is going to be responsible for offering scholarships to players and trainers who are all in need. We are your hosts. My name is Michael Lancaster, and this is the legendary Bryce Stanhope. And today we're going to talk about issues that affect dreams, which is always going to be a big topic of what we go over, because ultimately our job is to support basketball player dreams and trainer dreams, and I think this one kind of affects both. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off reading a recent quote by a trainer on social media. And whenever we do this, we're not attacking that trainer. I hope you don't even know who this trainer is. We're not going to be tagging their name. But it just simply is a illogical type of post that goes out there. Yeah. And I should say an illogical commentary that's around. And stuff like this can almost seem like it makes sense unless you dig into it. Yeah, it sounds good, but... It lacks logic. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and tear this apart, but first I'm just going to go ahead and read this. So, player development is just as much about subtraction as it is about addition. As trainers, we're often worried about adding moves to someone's bag, adding skills, but oftentimes we can get just as much results by taking things away, by removing certain bad habits, by removing certain tendencies. If a player has a tendency to catch and put the ball on the floor, we can get them more results by eliminating that. If someone over dribbles a lot, scaling it back, eliminating some of those bad habits to be more efficient, which is going to help them perform better. So next time you work with a player, don't just think about what we can add, but what we can subtract to help elevate their game. And that's what player development is all about. So there's a lot of different ways to go after this. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind to me is just a lack of understanding of the divisions kind of of training. He's trying to lump everything together as just one wholeheartedly, like, this is what player development is. Classic it's just this. blanket statement. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the word that I would spend the most time on, is he says player development. Which, yeah. by the way, I hate the phrase. Yeah. Player development means nothing. So the way that I try to get people to understand this, if you were talking about medical field specialties, mm -hmm. There are 20 different medical field specialties that I've been able to find just looking it up. Yeah. And even within those 20 medical field specialties, then there's subcategories within those. So yeah. one thing that's very broad up would be neurology. Mm -hmm. And inside neurology, you'd still have neuroscientists who do the research. You still yeah. have um, neurosurgeons and you have neurologists um, who, who, medic who are basically, they give people medicine to help with their neurological issues. So that stuff goes crazy, but that's what people do with basketball training yeah. is they try to lump it all together. Mm -hmm. What does player development even mean? So what I want to do is just look real quickly. I wrote down the definition of development. Yeah. So development means a specified state of growth or advancement. Mm -hmm. Development means a new and refined product or idea. It's mm -hmm. always talking about something new. It's talking about growth. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. If mm -hmm. I went into a development, I'm expecting buildings to be going up. Yeah, new. Not Adding. demolition. Yeah. Not, that's not, you yeah. might do that first, I guess, at times. Yeah. But typically, development is growing, not demolishing. Yeah. So when we're talking about this topic of player development, we need to get very, very specific. Yeah. Most of the time, especially if I was to go ahead and, and go ahead and take this quote a little bit farther, this is not about player development. Mm -hmm. This is talking about game management. If you're talking about taking something away, you're not developing a player, you're managing what they use. Yeah. So a lot of times play, trainers are not in player development. Yeah. They are in game management. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. No. But we have to get to the bottom of what these things actually are because how dare you throw a blanket statement over this industry and tell yeah. us what player development is all about. I, th I, do, I do truly think that the industry is getting better at understanding the differences and stuff because, you know, we, we've seen it when we've gone to conferences and stuff. He's like, people are really starting to absorb and understand the idea of like, like you've, you had a great statement a while ago about how like, you know, no, nobody's ever had a, a problem with the idea of like, you know, a, a skill trainer or player development coach, but also there's shooting coaches. Right. Like there are two different categories. Like this guy might not need, you know, a skill coach or player, but he's really struggling with shooting, so he needs to go see a shooting coach. Yeah, no one ever argues about the existence of shooting coaches. Yeah, it's two it's two separate things with that. So I, I think now, and I think it's just the develop or like the years and years of, you know, basketball evolving as well, 
is that as players have gotten more skilled, this is a relatively new concept of player development versus skill training where we have players who are getting more and more skilled where obviously back in the day a little bit, players weren't necessarily as skilled. They were more right. just managing what they're good at, fill that role, and that's just what they did. Versus what we're talking about is the development of the game and how far it's coming along. Skill training is a huge, huge need because there's going to be less and less role players because players are starting to be able to do everything. So to get to that next level, you're going to need to find yourself a skill trainer to add those abilities. If not, you're going to kind of get left to the wayside a little bit. Right. So let's go over the actual logic now of this because yeah. that's exactly – you know, this sounds right. What he's trying to do is he's trying to talk about um, – Basically, addition by subtraction. Yeah. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah. So if I, if I read the beginning of this, he says player development is just as much about subtraction as it is about addition. So mm -hmm. he's talking about addition by subtraction. But he said, as trainers, we're often worried about adding moves to someone's bag or adding skills, but oftentimes mm -hmm. we can just get as much results by taking things away. Well, if you take something away, you got to replace it with something. Yep. If I take away a, a certain set of footwork, what footwork are you going to have them do? Yeah. It's illogical to say just oh. take things away. There has to be something that takes its place. Otherwise, nothing happens. Yeah. So this is not addition by subtraction. You have to understand this would be subtraction by addition. Yeah, absolutely. So if I go ahead and I listed out all of the footworks that we could come to a stop. Yeah. And we, we could go over speed stops, inverted speed stops, power stops, jump stops, all these different stops. If a player has all of them then a game management trainer mm -hmm. can help that player's efficiency by taking some things away. Yeah, and, and, and we, we've actually done that in the past. We helped a player, um, you went through like a 20-game series and wrote down, you know, every set of footwork that they used, you know, what were they scoring out of, what was highest. You know, the player thought jump stops was one of their best shots. Right. It turned out to be one of their worst shots. So now that's where I, I guess you could start to talk about like the whole – you know, let's veer away from this a little bit until you get better at it. Let's veer towards, you know, he was shooting great out of drops on the left side. So let's try to add more of that. Like, that, that's where I think the concept of what he's talking about is just a little off. Game management. Exactly. That's managing what a player uses. Yeah, 100%. And you only can do that if they already have it. Yeah. So if your advice to trainers here is that's what player development is all about, yeah. taking things away, well, first off, player development coaches – you have to make sure they have the other things. Yeah. So first, you have to build the skills. You got to make sure they have yeah. the footworks, they have the parts in the games that you actually in, of the game that you actually want them to use. Yep. And then you can go ahead and start managing what they don't use. But I think this is the problem, though. How often have we ever had a player come in or ever worked with a player that we were like, "Wow, they're extremely skilled." Not a whole lot. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't happen very often. So it's just like play, people still don't really understand how to look at a player and be like, "Wow, they're really skilled." It's usually they can do basic sets of footwork well and they fall them into a bundle of skill. But again, we put, you know, if we do a measurement up against, a, you know, someone that they called skilled and then put them against somebody like a Kyrie Irving who is actually skilled, a Luca who is actually skilled, there's obviously a very big difference here when we go like, oh, this guy's skilled. And then you put him up against a skilled people. Yeah. They're not skilled. We need to define what skill actually means. Yeah. And that's the hard part for a lot and, of And a lot of it's this, this whole constraint led movement approach, yeah. which if you really look at our training, we do a lot of constraints, but the definitions of what we would call constraint led training compared to what a lot of people out there yeah. are calling constraint led training are very, very different. Yeah. And I'm not a huge fan of broad, undetailed constraint led yeah. training because yeah. all you're going to do is you create a scenario in which people have to follow a certain set of rules. Mm -hmm. And you're basically hoping that the environment creates the skill. Yeah. And who's that going to work with? Yeah. The most natural of players. The natural players. Only the best are going to yeah. be able to do it. And everyone who's not natural is just going to struggle. Yep. That, and, and so there, it's almost like so, – we don't have time to go into all this. But there's so much training right now that's basically preaching less detail, more environment. Yeah. And hoping that that works for players. So – but because we have this, this whole movement of this broad lack of detail, mm -hmm. constraint-led training, I don't think very many people know what skills actually are. No. They look at skill as results, yeah. not as skill as technique. Yeah. And I, but I think that's a hard part for most people because um, not, not to kind of pump us up at all, but how many trainers have we met that have actually gone through the amount of detail to sit down 
and write down every single set of footwork that they can find. Right. It's, it's, it's very rare. So like, and like, I remember when I, when I first started, you had told me this too, is like, when you start to kind of look at skill in the way that we do with footwork and stuff, you start watching the game completely different. And I think, I think that's been one of the funnest things about, you know, I still watch, you know, NBA games. I don't watch much college, but when you actually know footwork, watching guys is incredible. Like watching stuff, like we were just looking at a set of footwork the other day. It was like a, you know, a, a split between, he did like a touch in there and then he did a like, oh, he went delay drop with a touch and then like a split through. Like the amount of just skill in that where like most people would just be like, oh, he went through his legs. Yeah, that's all they see. That's why they can't give that to another player. And they would basically give players as much wiggle room as they want yep. under their constraints to yep. just pull off of between the legs in any way they can. Yeah. But a lot of players will do that in such sloppy ways yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. So they have no way of really do uh, form constraints, yeah. technique constraints. So a whole different topic. Yeah. But that's one of the issues. So we need to identify what skills actually are. And when I go back into this, so so far this is just illogical. Player development is just as much about subtraction as it about addition, yep. only if they have everything already. Yep. So then he goes on to say, by removing certain bad habits by removing certain tendencies. If a player has a tendency to catch and put the ball on the floor, we can get them more results by eliminating that. Now, once again, that's talking about mm -hmm. game management. Yeah. But this whole idea that a player has a bad habit of over dribbling, yeah. we need to also clarify that. Yeah. A big part of our certification has always been, it's not about over dribbling. It's about understanding the purpose of dribbles and having yeah. necessary dribbles. Mm -hmm. So, so often, you know, people just throw out broad, this, this whole thing is just broad, broad, broad. Yeah. It, we throw out these broad blanket statements of over dribbling and that could just be, oh, you want me to take less dribbles? Okay. Yeah. But you have to replace that with good timing yeah. and understanding what the dribbles are for. Yeah. So it's just so much broad language. And so people who only know how to look at the game broadly like this can be like, oh yeah, great yeah. stuff. And I'm just seeing illogic. I'm just yeah. saying things that aren't actually going to do you any good. Yeah. And you have to, once again, okay, you take some of those dribbles away, what are you going to give them instead? Yeah. Is it now a triple threat skill? Yeah. Is it now, you know, you have to give them something. Yeah. So if they don't have that, taking it away will do nothing. Yeah. So once again, it, this points to, I need to give a player more skill before I can take anything Absolutely. away. Absolutely. So again, it's subtraction by addition. I've always been a true believer in this, especially with the years that we've been doing this, is just like... You give somebody an abundance of skill, they eventually start to figure out how to almost not need some of it and use it when they just feel like it. Where like obviously like we watch Kyrie, like I have players do this all the time where don't just watch, you know, a season highlights because you're going to see the craziest stuff. But if you watch a full game highlight, you'll notice the times that he is doing stuff simple. One dribble, jab, shoot, like... But it's because since he has all this skill that he can tap into, he can also go back and know when he doesn't need it. Versus players who don't have skill, it's very, very hard because when I have to get out of a certain situation and I have to try to tap into skill that I don't have, it just doesn't work. Least skilled player in the NBA, go. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Just, just, throw out some, just throw out a big that we all know doesn't have skill. It doesn't have to be the least. Thomas Bryant. Thomas Bryant. Just okay. a big guy. All right. So you're going to say he, he lacks some skill. Yeah. Okay. Thomas Bryant would have a hard time playing every role of basketball. Absolutely. Because he lacks skill. Yep. Kyrie Irving could play, as far as size-wise, a lot of different positions, a lot of different roles. Yeah. He could be a spot-up shooter. He could put the ball on the floor. Yeah. He can play a bunch of different yep. roles. That's the difference. So you don't help you know, a Thomas Bryant you know, by just not giving him skills. Yeah, absolutely. You'd give him more skills and then he can use whatever skills he needs for his role. Yeah. And so it, it, we have to understand that, yes, from an efficiency standpoint, you have to learn how to play using the skills that you have. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you don't give people skills. Yeah. The more skills they have, yeah. the more roles they can choose. Yeah. It's, it's, that's logic. And play, players are smarter than what people give them credit for. Like just because you give the guy this skill, this skill... That, doesn't mean he's going to start trying to go out there. You know, it's kind of this area. Everybody's always talking about getting in your bag. They're not going to just start doing too much for no reason. Like, they're smart players. You know, they're going to, they're going to play with it at times. But it's the same thing, especially with a Thomas Bryant. You know, he's a big. Look at the other bigs he's having to play against. How do you guard Jokic? How do you guard Carl Towns? How do you guard and beat bigs that are now skilled 
that still, I would say most of them don't do too much. They right. just tap into the skill when they need to. And here, and, and so a lot of times coaches and trainers are fearful that if they give a Thomas Bryant skill, yeah. that he's going to start using yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Yeah. You can give someone skill and they may not use it, but you've still helped their body. Mm-hmm. You've helped them in different ways. Mm-hmm. And who knows? He might be able to put the ball on the floor a couple times That's it. when it's needed. That's it. J.J. Redick is a great example. He talked about in a podcast of how he – tried to train in similar ways as Kyrie because Kyrie would talk about how he would just put together combinations of moves. Yep. And so Kyrie was, hey, this is what I do. It works. And JJ said, yeah, but I did that too. It yeah. didn't work for me. Yeah. So JJ was working on the skills but wasn't able to apply it in the same way as Kyrie. Yeah. However, him working on the skills didn't mean that he was always trying to put the ball on the floor all the time. Yeah. He worked on them, and hopefully it allowed him to put the ball on it more. Yep. So he was able to put, get a little bit more loose with the basketball over his career. At least he understood yep. he had some confidence to put the ball on the floor. Absolutely. But you don't got to use it just because you have it. No. So we have to stop being fearful of skills mm-hmm. and first understand before we can subtract anything, we have to make sure that we have more additions. Yeah. And so, and, and when you can break it down like we do from a skill enhancement perspective, because yeah. we're not talking about game management, we're talking about skill enhancement, and skill enhancement is not subtraction, it's addition. Yeah. And so, if you can look at it that way, and you can really break things down by all the different footworks that, that are possible, all the different types of stops that are possible, the different finishes that are possible, you can give that to a player then let them choose what they want to use yeah. based on their coach, their role, based on their own comfort level and identity. Yeah. And that's the issue. Absolutely. But don't say this is what player development is yeah. all about. That's what you're all about. Yeah. That's fine. You're a game management, management trainer. Mm-hmm. Own that. But don't try to tell me that that's what yeah. I should be doing. And that's the issue that we have in the trainer world so much is just these people who are trying to throw blanket statements over the industry mm-hmm. – and say, this is what basketball training is. Not for everybody and not for yeah. every coach. Let people, let the shooting coach be the shooting coach. Let the skill enhancement trainer be the skill enhancement mm-hmm. trainer. Let the game management trainer be the game management yeah. trainer. Now, what I will say, if you are that game management trainer, I hope that you have something to go off of yeah. outside of your poor Division three career. Yeah. Or your, I didn't yeah. make it out of high school career. Like, that's when it actually helps to have some basketball yeah. experience behind you. Because your game management, meaning you're trying to put your opinion of how someone should play yeah. onto them. And that's when experience really matters. Yeah. So, I would say that's what you, you said, and I, and that's I, a little risky. And I think that, that, is, that is when, like, we've seen this over the past where, like, NBA players, you know, the older veteran guys start to try to help the younger guys. Usually when they're talking to the younger guys, they're talking more from a game X's and O's. Right. Like, hey, if this player is in this, you know, period or this position, you know, he's facing more baseline. Like, if you go this way and then over the middle, this space is open. We don't do that. Like, right. that's not what we do as skill enhancement trainers. And I think that's why, that's why it's such a good relationship. Like, we've always been really big on, you know, players having a team. You know, it's worked out really well for us. Obviously, I handle a lot of shooting stuff. You do some shooting stuff. We both do skills. So when we've passed NBA players back and forth, we're handling their skill enhancement and their shooting now. They still, when they go back to their teams, have game management trainers. Right. That's why it's always worked out so well. And sometimes they'll ask us for our game management, you know, thoughts. Yeah. And, and that's fine. That's where I can give my opinion on where I think you could be using some things. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. That's all part of it. But skill enhancement is a completely different yeah. mindset of let's get your footwork right, your body right. Let's make sure that you have more tools um, so you can have some freedom on the floor. Yeah. And then, like we always talk about. You can play for any coach, play yeah. with any system, and yeah. play any role. Um, so th- that's that's the issue. I mean, this was just a simple thing that that someone was saying yeah. in a very broad way. But I would completely disagree with the final advice. So next time you work with a player, don't just think about what we can add, but what we can subtract to help elevate their game. If you're going to take that advice, you, that's fine. Just understand you're a game management yeah. trainer. And you better hope that they already have the skills you want them to use or that advice is going to hurt them. Yeah. So if that's your advice, make sure those things are in line. For us, from a skill enhancement perspective, we're going to give you the different options so your body is equipped. Yep. So when you have a game management trainer, you have everything you need if they did want you to take it away. Or if, a, or if your team wants you to do a little bit of less of something, a little bit more of the other, that you have 
already yeah. in your game what they want you to use. Mm -hmm. That's the power of this all. So the reason why I brought that up is because that's, that type of belief system will impact players' dreams negatively mm -hmm. if they buy into it, and it will really impact trainers' dreams too and how, yeah. and how much. So we need to have better understanding of this all together. Absolutely. And that's another episode of Dream Loudly. Thank you for joining us. And once again, keep your eyes out for the Dream Loudly Foundation as we will be offering scholarships for players and trainers who are in need. We'll see you next time.